So hi, welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be able to talk to this audience. Uh, today, I'll be talking to you about some of our research on using generative AI methods for drug discovery. So I'll be talking about, I'll be introducing what are generative AI methods. This term is still unfamiliar to some people. Uh, as for myself, I'm currently a professor at Kansas State University in the US in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. My personal research is on structure-based and computational drug design, primarily in the area of cancer and immunology. Uh, although we have started to do several major side projects in malaria and COVID-19. My current focus of my work is in machine learning for drug design. Uh, in terms of my background, uh, I have, I continue to do and have been trained in both computational and experimental aspects of drug discovery research. And uh, my primary experimental tool is protein crystallography. <clears throat> Some of my special interests related to drug discovery, uh, this method of generative AI uh, that I'll be talking about. I'm interested in the role of protein dynamics and conformational change as it relates to drug discovery. I'm interested in uh, the drug ability of different drug targets, uh, assessing where are good binding sites, especially if they're not obvious allosteric sites, uh, trying to expand the chemical diversity of the drugs that we develop. So that means exploring un unusual or underused scaffolds and functional groups. Uh, broader applications of AI, so applications of AI to chemistry, image processing, and drug discovery. And most of my research experience has been with some of the well-known drug target families, GPCRs, uh, primary, uh, the most recently nuclear hormone receptors, and previously as a postdoc uh, work on kinases and phosphatases. Okay, let me introduce you to some basic aspects of AI machine learning and deep learning. Uh, this is actually quite uh, a technical field and it's been, I think a lot of people find it quite fascinating, but are perhaps somewhat intimidated to dig deeper. You don't need to be a master of all of the technical terms and mathematical concepts, uh, but here's, a, I will give you a bit of a guide map <clears throat> to getting started. So generally the term artificial intelligence has been around for over 50 years, and it's the superset of many other techniques that are now in common use. Uh, machine learning, which is basically uh, extended statistical learning, and deep learning are terms that are in common use now. Deep learning refers to a specific technique which uses uh, a deep layer, many deep layers of neural networks for computing. So neural networks lie at the heart of modern advanced machine learning. Uh, we've had neural networks actually for close to 50 years, but it wasn't until uh, the last 20 years or so that people found that by using deep neural, neural networks that we could actually get high performance uh, computing out of them. Previously, people were exploring using these simple neural networks, and they only could know how to do calculations with these simple types of neural networks. And uh, they, their performance was not competitive with other uh, simpler methods of machine and statistical learning. So most these days, a lot, most of the higher profile work that you see in the media uh, with a work by DeepMind, uh, self-driving cars, uh, soft, uh, computers that can beat humans at chess or Go all involve deep learning uh, software. So what is at the heart 
of these neural net, uh, deep neural networks that allows them to be so such powerful tools. So basically, uh, a deep, large neural network acts as a universal approximator. So they can approximate any kind of function. Now, this isn't too new for those of us in crystallography. So of course, in our work, we use four, uh, Fourier series functions to approximate the, the image that we are trying to uh, uh, solve, determine in our crystals. So you can think of it as similar to that. So the larger your neural network, the more one can uh, approximate your, uh, your function. Now this brings up a lot of problems uh, and topics that for those of us as crystallographers or structural biologists are actually already well versed with. And in fact, are areas where we might have more expertise than some current practitioners of machine learning. So uh, the issues of using probability and statistics, global and local optimization, and how to avoid getting stuck in areas of local, uh, local minima or uh, optima. Uh, what we use for cross-validation. So for crystal structures and refinement, we use the R-free method. Uh, this is a general type of method for cross-validation. Basically, we want to make sure that we're not overfitting our data. Uh, um, we already mentioned approximating complex functions using uh, Fourier series. And a lot of this kind of work is very similar to the kind of mathematical approaches that we see for strict uh, protein structure production, protein structure prediction, and that now we know uh, the work of AlphaFold2, for example, uh, uh, work of energy minimization and solving the crystallographic phase problem. These are all very machine learning types of work that one could use machine learning to attack using uh, uh, concepts that we are already familiar with. So in terms of different issues in science with, regard, uh, with implementing machine learning, uh, you can think of it really that machine learning is a, simply an advanced form of curve fitting, approximating a function. So the strength comes from the statistics that are used, large data sets that are analyzed, and of course, the new advances in computing power. The curve fitting that's done by machine learning is very cool. It can exploit nonlinear fitting. And I think for the, uh, the, older, the more older folks in the audience, uh, when they hear, when we hear the term curve fitting, we always, we think, oh no, because with curve fitting, the danger of curve fitting is that it's very easy to overfit. If you just have a few points on your, on your data set, you can fit it in an arbitrary number of ways. Uh, how do you determine which way is better and makes sense? So this is a serious problem. This is compounded by the problem that we have in, sci in experimental scientific data is that our data sets often are limited in size. So if we draw from one crystal structure, uh, we might end up with thousands of atoms, uh, tens of thousands of reflections, et cetera, but that's still relatively small. We know now, for example, that uh, AlphaFold2 was successful because it drew from the entire PDB. So that's over 100,000 PDB files. The data is expensive and slow to come by. So if you need extra crystal structures, well, you might be waiting a long time to, uh, to get that kind of data. So this is as opposed to how companies like Facebook and Google work they, they work on data that's easy to accumulate, such as images, uh, 
user interaction and how they click on ads, for example. So because they have that wealth of data that's easily and cheaply collected, they can do very advanced, powerful forms of uh, machine learning analysis. Okay, so now let's get to the drug discovery part. <clears throat> I will tell you about some of the work that we've done as founders of the open source COVID-19 drug discovery consortia. So this is based on my previous work, my long-term work with open source malaria run by Professor Matt Todd at University College London. I've been working with Matt for about six or seven years uh, on open source malaria. It is the largest open source drug discovery consortia in the world. And they've made tremendous progress synthesizing and testing over 400 compounds for malaria. So inspired by my experience with OSM, I started OSC-19 along similar principles. So one, that this would be a nonprofit open source drug discovery consortium that is open to all scientists from all around the world. Uh, we quickly assembled a number of research assets, uh, primarily on a volunteer basis. We ran on a almost zero budget. Uh, so we had computational drug design, chemical synthesis, biochemical testing, crystallography, and live viral testing. The heart of our consortia were uh, our groups, my lab and other labs at Kansas, uh, the University of Toronto, which led the machine learning aspects, and the Worcester Institute in Philadelphia, which did the biochemistry work. So this was at the early heart, early time of the pandemic when uh, labs were pretty much shut down all around the world. So the Worcester was given permission as a well-established antivirus research lab to continue operating. Whereas the rest of us here basically could do only computer work. We chose for our target, the MPRO protease from the coronavirus. So this protease has well, has, was uh, recognized from the beginning as the most promising small molecule drug target. Uh, it's also known as 3CL or main protease. So this protease is required for cutting the polypeptide that comes out of uh, the translation of the viral genome. The, the different proteins in the virus come out as one large polypeptide, and they have to be cleaved by this protease and another protease into their separate functional proteins. So by inhibiting this protein, uh, by this protease, then the virus cannot replicate. And this is a known, uh, a known way to uh, kill viruses in other virus families. So we had, there was information from the first SARS epidemic from about over 15 years ago. So uh, the, the sequence conservation of the MPRO protease between the first SARS and the current SARS viruses is very high on the order of over 85%. And we could build on the work of researchers who had, uh, who had developed prototype drugs for uh, the first SARS coronavirus. Uh, not surprisingly, what happened with that first SARS uh, uh, research-wise was that the uh, that virus quickly faded away and everyone who worked on their projects lost funding. and <laughs> All of that research was shelved. Okay, so our strategy, uh, we performed virtual screening of Drug Bank, which is a database of clinically used drugs, as well as drugs that have entered advanced experimental testing and clinical trials and animal trials. So that would give us a, uh, hopefully the quickest results to finding compounds that might be actually be in use. And then 
uh, to complement that, we would use some of our AI methods that we have been developing with people with the group at University of Toronto. Uh, this is more ex uh, of a experimental work. Uh, we thought it would be a good test of our state of the art of our algorithms. How ready are they for a real life uh, drug design problem? So first, I would just talk to you a little bit about our results from the virtual screening, and then I will focus the rest of my talk on the AI generation part. <clears throat> oh, I want to emphasize this one thing. Uh, what, it, what turned out to be very uh, important to our work was to do virtual screening of covalent inhibitors. So many known antiviral drugs that attack the protease are covalent inhibitors. And screening covalent inhibitors takes requires a different approach than traditional virtual screening because not only do you have to find a drug that fits in a binding pocket, but you have to model the formation of that covalent bond between, in this case, this is a cysteine protease, so the reactive thiol of the cysteine with the electrophile of your different drugs. And this is, uh, a, at this state in time, the software that's available for doing this kind of work is rather clunky. You need to be, you need to define the chemistry that takes place uh, for uh, all of your different compounds. So that requires quite a lot of manual work. But that actually turned out to be the key to our screen. Uh, we quickly identified a compound uh, that was, uh, that that uh, the, the software I, uh, found to be the best and confirmed it in the lab, that this is a compound called GC376. <clears throat> and at about the same time, several other academic labs uh, reported and published on this compound as well. This coincidentally turned out to be a compound that was uh, developed at my own campus by investigators that I did not know. They were, it was developed by uh, researchers at the veterinary school. So GC376 was develop, developed over 10 years ago as a uh, viral treatment for uh, animals, uh, including coronavirus for house cats. So there is a common uh, lethal, usually lethal coronavirus infection that can infect house cats. And this drug was tested on a, a number of house cats, somewhere on the order of 70 to 90 house cats and demonstrated great effectiveness. However, the drug required IV administration and had issues with poor solubility. The potency of this drug was quite high, somewhere on the order of 10 nanomolar against uh, viral replication. So we focused on the chemical uh, uh, structure of this, two parts of this drug. So here on the right, uh, this is the electrophilic warhead. So GC376 is actually a prodrug and this bisulfite gets converted into an aldehyde, which is the true electrophile warhead. In, in the cell. And we were advised by our medicinal chemists that, <clears throat> that an aldehyde is probably too reactive to make for a good drug. Uh, a drug that's too reactive has a higher likelihood of off-target effects. And uh, so we wanted to, we wanted to take a, uh, a different, uh, weaker nuclear uh, electrophile. We also uh, dis decided that there is room to optimize this group here. This, it, you, some of you might recognize that this is just a carboxybenzo protecting group left over from synthesis. Uh, it actually turned out to be fairly effective functionally, but it is far, uh, metabolically unstable. And there is certainly room for improvement here. 
And the goal was to get a drug that had a little bit more potency with better oral availability. So we began working on this project. Uh, on our part, the synthetic chem our synthetic chemistry partners, uh, it was slow progress for them. Uh, during this time, uh, Pfizer had announced two series of compounds, uh, one in 2020 and, and one from last year that had some similarities to our compound. Uh, the first one in 2020 was a shown to be effective, but like our drug was only, uh, could only be administered by IV. And this past year, they came up with a new drug, which is now called Nermaltrevir, also Paxlovid. This has now been approved for uh, human use. It showed uh, great effectiveness in clinical trials. And we, were, we felt uh, vindicated because you see that there is close similarity between the Pfizer drug, this entire right-hand side of the Pfizer molecule is identical to that of our drug, including the nitrile warhead and the, and the lactam here. And then this half of Paxlovid is essentially the same, is lifted from the same half of a hepa old hepatitis C drug called bosepravir. Now, bosepravir on its own is not effective against uh, 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 SARS-CoV-2. But uh, by using this half from bosepravir, which was an orally administered dr drug, they were able to uh, provide good pharmacokinetics and oral bioavailability availability to uh, this new SARS drug. So we again, we felt that this was a good validation of our work. Obviously, we don't have the same resources as Pfizer, uh, but we're continuing on this line to explore different warheads and we'll hopefully we can write a paper on it and maybe come up with some new designs. Okay, so now I want to switch topics to that of generative AI and its application to drug design. So first, what is generative AI? So this term is not in common use yet. What this means, this is a different application of current AI methods. So the most common applications are classification <clears throat> and regression. So classification, for example, you look at pictures and you ask the computer to classify the pictures as dog or cat. Very good, they're very good at it now. Okay, so regression. Regression is not uh, related to this, but let's say related more to drug chemistry. You give it a number of drugs and you ask it to predict which drug is the most potent. Now here with generative AI, what we're doing is we provide the software a training data set of images. And you give enough images and then you tell the software to generate new examples of those kinds of images. So here we're talking about uh, images of human faces. And the software now is able to learn and generate new human faces. So all of the picture, all of the photos here are not real people. They're computer generated based on their huge uh, libraries of training data of what human faces look like. So the software is not explicitly taught what goes into a human face with eyes, nose, etc. It has learned it from its large data set. And if you look at these images, I think they're pretty convinc convincing. If you look really closely, you can see artifacts in quite a number of them. But uh, a quick glance by me, uh, I find them all convincing. So this, is act so this is the general approach that we're taking and it actually uses the same kinds of algorithms. We're taking this and trying to apply it to drug chemistry. Can we give the computer algorithms 
access uh, a training set of thousands of drug-like molecules and have it learn the basic rules of chemistry. We're not going to program, well, we will, uh, just a few basic rules to help it get started, but we can't teach medicinal chemistry to the computer and have the computer generate new examples of drug-like molecules given certain constraints that the user feeds into the algorithm. Simple things like we want the molecules to be a, a certain molecular weight range to have a certain log P not to, not to be too polar or not to be too hydrophobic. So then what happened? And then what we want to do with this is we want this to be able to explore chemical space. So we want to be able to explore the different kinds of molecules that can be used to make drugs. And we also want to be able to explore the physical and chemical space of the binding pocket to explore what are the best sites in the binding pocket to put pharmacophoric features. And this is aided by the availability of now increasingly accurate scoring functions to evaluate how well different drug molecules can fit into the binding site. This is a, a collaboration with Professor Alana Spuruguzic's group in Toronto. So chemical space. So for a given, for a, the size of a drug like molecule, the size, the number of combinations of atoms and how they can be attached to each other is astronomical, astronomical on the order of 10 to the 60th. So you can't thoroughly explore chemical space. We come up based on our experience and based on some practical issues such as uh, ease of synthesis, uh, what kind of chemical building blocks are easily uh, purchasable? Uh, what kind of compounds are typically available in high throughput screens? We will start in some kind of a priori most promising space. But very often you'll find, especially if you're working on a drug target that's not, that's quite different from the classical drug targets that you'll end up in a completely different chemical space. So the goal of this kind of research is to help uh, not just start here, but to be less biased by a lot of these really human and convenience factors and to be able to start anywhere and to have a better idea of what is the best chemical space and save you a lot of this time and effort starting from here and trying to work your way down here. Just give you a little, I don't want to have too much uh, discussion on the technical details of these algorithms, but I do want to give you an uh, idea of the, uh, how they work. So one of the approaches that we are, have been using uses something called, uh, is a variation of something that's widely used called a generative adversarial network. A generative adversarial network essentially pits two neural networks against each other. One neural network is responsible for generating the molecules. Another neural network is responsible for evaluating the molecules and saying whether it's good or not. Uh, and, the, and the algorithm takes user input in terms of what properties that we does, desire. So again, I'm. Uh, these can be simple things like molecular weight and solubility. Uh, in this case, we were the first to include docking scores, the fit of a compound into a, a drug target pocket as a desirable property. And so these two neural networks essentially compete with each other to try to make better and better molecules. And they learn in the process. And it actually works somewhat well. Uh, uh, it works in practice, but uh, uh, let me see, let me rephrase that. It works in principle. So let me show you where it still falls short. So here uh, we start, all we have to do is place 
a starting molecule, we can start with something like methane and we put it somewhere in the vicinity of the binding site. The uh, this algorithm over time uh, increases the size and sophistication of the molecule and you get something that's larger and larger and eventually you get something like this. Now, for those of you who are chemists, you'll say, oh, these are not drug-like molecules. In fact, like here, they look rather ridiculous. Okay, uh, we've been working on that. So from 2020 to 2021, we made a number of changes to the algorithm to get soft to get molecules that are more like real molecules one could actually synthesize. But still, these do not look like drug-like molecules. There's still a lot of work to do. So what I'm doing now is I'm going. To, I I started to call these pseudo molecules. So it generates pseudo molecules. But what good is a pseudo molecule? especially if you get a pseudo molecule that you can't synthesize. Well, one is that you can find simpler representations, uh, sim uh, simpler similar compounds uh, from databases like PubChem. And here is an example. And these are compounds that can be uh, readily purchased or synthesized and tested in the lab. And so in this case, uh, we found this simpler molecule and we found that it does dock well. Uh, we did not test it experimentally because the docking score was rather modest, but it does uh, dock well into the m -pro protease binding site. What I think is a more useful application though, is that these pseudo generated pseudomolecules can act to map out the, uh, a path for a potential drug in the binding site. So here in blue is the crystal structure of GC373 bound to m -pro protease. And we can see that the AI generated pseudomolecule recapitulates some of the key features of uh, GC373, but it also makes some very interesting differences. So first of all, the, topo the, po the, po the topology is completely different. That suggests that maybe this would be a better uh, topology for a drug molecule in this binding site. And you notice here at the top that the, uh, there's a benzene group that fits into this binding pocket that GC373 does not do. And this turns out to be very useful that eventually when the crystal structure of the Pfizer Paxlovid drug was released, that drug does have a large bulky group right here to capture and exploit this favorable interaction. So that's something that could have been learned from this pseudomolecule. So now I will show you another example. We're moving away from COVID. So this is some of our work on a GPCR called neurotensin receptor one. It's a GPCR that binds to a peptide. This is a receptor that's, uh, that's found in brain tissue. So this is a GPCR with a known crystal structure, which helps a lot. Uh, the crystal structure shows that it binds a six amino acid peptide RRPYIL, and we'll come back to that. And this has been studied as a potential drug target for cancers and schizophrenia. So we take the same generative AI approach and uh, we see something quite different. In the end, it gives us this long spaghetti molecule that uh, uh, when I had showed chemists this molecule, they just laughed. So what is the point of this long spaghetti molecule that is definitely not a drug? That looks not, looks not very good, right? Ah, so when you see that long spaghetti molecule fit into the, uh, docked into the crystal structure, you can see that it's actually quite impressive that it recapitulates the entire, uh, uh, the entire peptide 
in the crystal structure, and it actually captures some of the uh, pharmacophore features. Not all, because our generative AI doesn't have all of the functional groups available to it, but it does. It is able to capture the overall uh, topology and scaffold involved. So it's a great starting point if you want to use it for uh, drug design. Okay, and finally, I want to talk to you about a different architecture that we are exploring for drug design, uh, not involving generative adversarial networks. So here we are using a different method called deep reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning uh, actually is one of the simpler forms of AI in practice, in principle, but in practice, it can be difficult to uh, get it to converge. So this is based on an action reward structure. And it, is, uh, it has the advantage of being a very flexible platform. So you can use it. It is the approach that has been successfully used to develop algorithms that could play board games and video games against human players. It's flexible. You, you doesn't have to give, it's great for solving problems that are not strictly uh, solving math or physics problems. Uh, those chemistry problems can be reduced to solving math and physics problems. However, the way it works, and I'll explain that in a bit, is potentially less efficient and it often has problems converging. So reinforcement learning basically is the software has to learn the rules or what we call a policy to best uh, fit the data and to solve a problem. So you define a problem for the software. So in this case, it would be, please design a drug molecule that makes the best interactions with um, a drug target. And the software has to do this using uh, some trial and error and come up with the best approach to do this. And basically it's a brute force approach, but computers are good at brute force. And it has to be able to evaluate each state. And every time it does something good, a, uh, a given player, so you have a number of agents that uh, are trying to make molecules and, a, and we call these players. And each time one of these players is successful, you give it some points and you say, hey, that's a good rule or strategy you came up with. And then in the end, the agents, you can have the agents communicate with, with each other and share their strategies. And then, uh, and then you get your output. Uh, in practice, this is how it works for drug discovery. So we have these agents. The agents are all uh, asynchronous, which is kind of nice. This allows for distributed computing. So you can distribute all the agents over a very large uh, high performance computing or cloud computing system. And what we've done differently is that previously our, our drug uh, discover our drug generating algorithm basically made my, uh, mute, m random changes to the molecule one step at a time. Here, what we've done is that we've generated a molecule, uh, sorry, generated a library of drug like fragments and pharmacophores and linkages. And we tell the computer agents find ways to connect these pieces together to make drug-like molecules. And then we evaluate them using simple pharmacophore fitting. This is nice because this is very fast compared to three-dimensional docking. And then we, uh, we score them. And then we uh, have the agents communicate with each other and also look back at their previous history. This is called replay to see what results have worked best. And then we uh, then uh, provide the points, the positive and negative points for agents that have done a good job. And, the, and what this does, now this is for a different drug target, 
So here's a real drug target from the crystal structure. And here are the kind of molecules that are generated. So what you see are molecules that are generated now that are more complex than the ones that were generated previously. Uh, if you know enough chemistry, you can still recognize that these have some drug-like features, but none of the ones shown here are real drugs that one could readily synthesize. But it's another way of doing this. Uh, this has the advantage of being very easily computable, uh, very low uh, computing power requirements. But we both converge on the same set of problems that basically uh, this approach does generate molecule or pseudo molecules that fit well uh, and allow you to explore chemical diversity and allow you to explore the physical chemical space of the drug binding site. The problem is that we can only generate these kinds of pseudo molecules, these almost molecules. These molecules are not, uh, they don't, are not chem they're chemically not like drugs. So we say that they have poor drug likeness. Uh, many of them cannot be synthesized readily. This is an important in real life chemistry. You want your, the, you want your drugs to be something that a medicinal chemist can synthesize in a week or two at the most. Not, not a whole, uh, as one of our chemists got back to us, this would be a whole research project in itself. So that's not practical. Uh, we have a lot of ideas on how to improve synthetic accessibility. So that's something we're working hard on. And we also received a grant from Intel on how to accelerate these kinds of calculations using, uh, using uh, new types of uh, hardware architectures from Intel, such as GPUs and other kinds of parallel computing architectures. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, the, this is the group from our lab. Uh, a lot of the work has been led by two postdocs, Bo Tang and Bo Wang, and one of our graduate students, uh, Ye Zhou. Uh, the experimental work on COVID-19 was done by Troy Messick at the Worcester Institute. So again, our, la uh, our labs and most US labs were completely shut down. We weren't allowed to go in during the first part of the pandemic. So we could only do computer work. Uh, Professor Spuruguzik's group, so he's a real leader in, in AI chemistry, but he specializes in material science. Chemistry is chemistry when it comes to atoms and molecules, but material science is not the same as drug chemistry. So what we do is we try to take their ideas and apply them to a drug chemistry setting. Uh, we were we have been fortunate to work with senior experienced uh, med chemists from pharma, uh, Chris Southern, Southern and Peter Kenny from AstraZeneca. So they gave us a lot of useful practical advice. Our work has been sponsored by several groups, the U.S. National Science, Science Foundation and Department of Agriculture and uh, some small donations from uh, Intel and NVIDIA. Thank you very much for your time. I'll be happy to take questions.